Hello and welcome to Multimodality Imaging Conference. Uh, I'm Deepan Shaw, Head of Cardiovascular Imaging at, here at Houston Methodist. And this week we're going to continue on with the second part of our two-part series on assessment of the right ventricle and right-sided cardiac valves. Uh, and today we're going to focus on uh, use of CMR. So before we begin, uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, for those of you that are tuning in uh, via the web, uh, if you have any questions, which we'll ho hopefully have some time for questions at the end, uh, please go to pollev.com and enter debate key uh, and ask your question. Or via text message, you can text the word debate key to 37607 and text your question. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so last week, uh, Dr. Sharif Naga talked to us uh, about the role of echocardiography in assessment of the right side and right side of valves. And uh, for my outline today, I'm going to go into a little bit of the, the background of the uh, pathophysiology of the right ventricle. Um, talk a little bit about uh, how CMR is used to assess the right ventricle and then also talk a little bit about how it's used to assess tricuspid and pulmonic valve disease. Most of my talk will be focused on the tricuspid um, since uh, we'll have more uh, talks with regard to the pulmonic valve uh, when uh, Dr. Duarte speaks to us about congenital heart disease. So. Uh, just some basic background again, uh, and this is probably just a refresher from last week, which is that you know it's important to keep in mind that a normal RV would pump the same amount of blood or stroke volume as a normal LV should, um, and, but it has a uh, slightly larger volume. So the LV or the RV volume is typically about 10 to 15 percent larger than LV and diastolic volume. And as a result, since they're both pumping the same amount of blood, a normal RV ejection fraction tends to be a little bit lower than a normal LV ejection fraction. Uh, also important to keep in mind is that since the RV is contracting against a low pressure pulmonary vascular resistance system, the amount of stroke work that the RV does is quite a bit lower. So it's about a quarter of the stroke work that the normal LV does. And as a result, the RV wall is a thinner wall, typically three to five millimeters in thickness, uh, and is a much more compliant uh, uh, chamber as well. Um, you know, when we uh, think about the RV, I think it's important to really kind of break it down into three different components. There's the inlet component. This is basically the uh, tr uh, tricuspid valve and the subtricuspid apparatus. There's the outlet or the infundibular component, and this is the RV outflow tract uh, right below the pulmonic valve. And then you've got kind of the body or the apical segment of the RV, uh, which has uh, much more trabeculations within it. Um, a, a few things where the LV and the RV are similar uh, in several ways, or that they are linked in several ways. One, obviously, is the interventricular septum. That's really the wall that uh, you could think of as shared between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Uh, and then there's mutually encircling epicardial fibers, which really run across both the LV and the RV architecture. Um, in addition to that, the RV free wall uh, will attach to the interventricular septum at two locations, the anterior uh, as well as the inferior or posterior RV insertion site. And then also, I think importantly, um, is that both the LV and the RV share the pericardial space. Um, and obviously, in the setting when there's uh, any restriction to the pericardial space, uh, then there'll be an interdependence between the two chambers. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that you know, the interventricular septum actually contributes significantly to performance of the right ventricle. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's almost an equal contribution between the RV free wall uh, as well as the interventricular septum uh, as far as the effect on RV function and RV stroke volume. Uh, 
Another important thing I think to keep in mind is that the longitudinal shortening uh, is really a greater contributor to RV stroke volume uh, than the short axis circumferential shortening is. And so that's a little bit of a distinction also from the left ventricle. Um, and in fact, the RV longitudinal shortening may represent anywhere from 50 to 75% of the uh, contribution to the RV stroke volume. Now, what about the coronary circulation? So um, if we look at the interventricular septum, which again, as I mentioned, is also should be thought of as a part of the right ventricle, the interventricular septum is really supplied, I think as we all know, by the LAD for the anterior two-thirds, uh, and then by the right coronary artery and, and typically the, the posterior descending artery for the uh, inferior one-third of the septum. Uh, the RV free wall really receives its supply uh, from uh, RV marginals or acute marginals which supply the free wall of the right ventricle. Uh, oftentimes the inferior or diaphragmatic wall of the right ventricle may actually be supplied by branches off of the posterior descending artery. Uh, and also important to keep in mind is that the anterior portion of the RV uh, oftentimes is supplied by branches from the left anterior descending. Um, and then if we look at uh, the response of the LV and the RV to increasing afterload, you'll notice that the RV is much more sensitive to afterload changes so that even small chain increases in afterload lead to, lead to a significant drop off in uh, RV stroke volume compared to the LV, I think, which is much more tolerant to uh, afterload increases. So let's talk a little bit more now about the pathophysiology of the right ventricle. And so again, if we look in clinical practice, causes of right heart failure are really multifactorial. And this is a complex slide showing all the different uh, potential causes of impairment in, in uh, uh, the right heart. But I think you know, um, if we really break it down into two kind of uh, primary uh, uh, pathologies, one is pressure overload phenomenon. This can be either due to the most common condition which is left-sided heart failure uh, but other conditions such as pulmonary embolism pulmonary hypertension uh, as well as some uh, congenital conditions or to uh, processes which lead to a volume overload phenomenon and these are going to be primarily right-sided valve regurgitation uh, or congenital heart defects which lead to uh, excess volume on the right side of the heart um, and I think in general, the RV tends to adapt better to volume overload than it does to pressure overload uh, uh, physiology. And then uh, I think importantly to keep in mind is that RV wall stress is low in a normally functioning ventricle, uh, right ventricle, um, but that um, in the setting of systolic dysfunction, RV wall stress becomes increased. Uh, and then this is just showing that as a result of a uh, limited pericardial space, um, what can happen is, is that there can be this uh, interdependence between the right ventricle and the left ventricle uh, where uh, any increase in RV filling comes at the expense of the left ventricle and, and therefore this alteration in the shape of the interventricular septum. So let, let me move forward now and uh, pro go into a little bit more kind of what are the kind of four kind of distinct categories uh, of uh, scenarios where we'll encounter patients uh, with RV abnormalities. Um, and so these are really pulmonary hypertension, patients who have some left-sided uh, heart disease, and this can be either left-sided valvular disease, uh, left-sided cardiomyopathy with uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and also important to keep in mind that uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction leads to an increase in left-sided pressures, which can then ultimately be transmitted to the right ventricle as well. Uh, volume overload conditions in the right ventricle, and then uh, conditions that lead to abnormal RV myocardial performance. So this can be either underlying cardiomyopathies of the right ventricle, and we've touched on the uh, RV uh, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy in prior lectures, um, but also RV infarction, uh, which can occur uh, most commonly in the setting of uh, uh, left LV infarction which can then lead to an impairment in RV function and contractility. So let's really kind of focus now on how it is that uh, we use MRI to assess the right ventricle. So um, you know, I think a couple of things to keep in mind is that um, 
assessing the right ventricle is complicated because the shape of the RV is, is much more distinct than the shape of the LV. The RV has a crescent shape. Uh, there's a separation between the RV inflow and the RV outflow. Um, and as a result of this, these differences, really no uniform geometric assumptions can be made uh, to give you an accurate assessment of volumes. Um, and also, you generally can't image the entire RV within any single view uh, because of, of its unique shape. Uh, and there can be really variations in the direction or location of the right ventricle uh, between different patients, which is very common as well. Um, and so I think as a result, you know, our goal when we're trying to assess the right ventricle uh, by volumes and ejection fraction uh, is really to try to get serial tomographic images of the right ventricle. Um, so again, the goal is not to just do it based on one single view, but rather a series of views, and we'll go through and talk about how we do that. And one of the reasons I think is because of this unusual shape of the RV, just depending upon where a particular four chamber view is drawn or is prescribed can affect the size of the RV that you'll see on just a two dimensional view. Uh, and, and you can see here, there's, there's three example scenarios, uh, which is just a, a slight angulation in where the four chamber view is prescribed can result in significant differences in the visualized size of the right ventricle on a single 2D uh, imaging plane. And our goal, obviously, for the right ventricle is to try to see the view of the RV or the four chamber view that maximally opens up the right ventricle. And therefore, uh, when we're uh, scanning a patient, uh, it's important that the technologist prescribes a four chamber view so that you're going through the anterolateral wall the inferoceptal wall, and you're going through the area which gives you the maximum RV dimension, which then is going to show you the largest RV. So as a result of that, I think, you know, one of the things I always tell folks when they're first starting to look at MRI, if they're coming from a background uh, from echocardiography, you have to kind of recalibrate your eyes because the RV will always look a little bit bigger than what you're typically used to seeing uh, on echocardiography. The other thing I think that's, that's uh, an advantage of MRI, again, because of this uh, uh, ability to to identify to uh, prescribe unlimited imaging planes, um, also the ability to have a large field of view to get a complete assessment of intracardiac and extracardiac anatomy, and then the fact that uh, there's no impairments in endocardial border definition of the RV. Um, because there's uniformity across the image, um, which allows you to get a good assessment both of LV endocardial borders as well as RV endocardial borders. And then some of the unique aspects of MRI, I think, are the ability to assess fibrosis, uh, scar, fat, or thrombus uh, within the heart. And then I think in addition to that, uh, as I'll show you where we utilize tomographic nature of MRI to actually uh, derive a RV volume uh, as well as ejection fraction. So here's examples of some uh, uh, of patients. Uh, first one here is a normal patient with a normal right ventricle. Uh, if we look at the left-hand side here is a patient who has uh, significant uh, RV dysfunction, as you can see, uh, with very uh, reduced uh, RV ejection fraction. And then in the right-hand side here, uh, at the bottom, we see a patient who has significant RV dilatation. So again, our goals are not just to, to identify the presence or absence of dysfunction or dilatation, but actually to quantify the extent of that. And I'll go through and show how we do that with MRI. And then in addition to that, um, also important to look at RV wall thickness. And as I mentioned earlier, a normal RV wall thickness should be between three to five millimeters. Uh, so anything more than that is indicative of right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, as in this patient here, where we see really severe RVH. So let's talk about the particular views that we're going to get. So in addition to the standard short axis views and the standard long axis views that we get of the left ventricle, which are the two, three, and the four chamber view, uh, on most CMR studies, we'll also try to prescribe uh, a few additional views which allow us to look at the right ventricle. Uh, and, and one view is this view right here, which is called an RV three chamber view, or some people refer to it as an RV inflow outflow view. Uh, and this is prescribed off of the short axis 
and the long axis views where you're trying to bisect the right ventricle uh, and go through the midpoint of the tricuspid valve. Uh, the goal here is not to go all the way to the apex, but rather to go just a little bit away from the, the uh, apex of the ventricle, of the right ventricle. And, and that produces this view, which is shown here on the right hand side. Uh, and from a frame of reference standpoint, what this allows you to see is the superior vena cava, the right atrium, the tricuspid valve, the RV, uh, as well as the kind of the RV apex and the posterior or inferior uh, wall of the right ventricle, um, and allows you to see the RV alpha tract and the infundibular area, and typically will also show you the pulmonary artery. And in this view, you typically you'll see a little bit of the ascending aorta as well. So uh, beside the RV three chamber view, we also try to get uh, this view right here, which we call the right ventricular alpha tract view. And this is done by prescribing a, 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 per, a perpendicular imaging plane from the RV three chamber view that we just uh, uh, prescribed earlier, uh, and making sure that you're bisecting through the pulmonary artery, typically done off of an axial view. Uh, and that produces this view right here, which gives you now an orthogonal view to assess the right ventricular uh, infundibulum, as well as the pulmonary artery uh, and the pulmonic valve. Now, for RV ejection fraction assessment, the most common way that's done for really volumes as well as ejection fraction is to just use your series of short axis cine images that you've obtained uh, for assessment of the left ventricle. Uh, but in this case, you would contour the endocardial uh, borders in diastole and systole of each individual right ventricular short axis slice. And then by summating these volumes together, you, you get an RV end diastolic volume. And if you do the same thing in systole, you get then an RV end systolic volume as well. Uh, and then obviously an ejection fraction uh, by comparison of the two. So, uh, you know, because again of the, the ability to have this kind of complete tomographic visualization of the RV, um, you, you're able to, to achieve fairly reproducible measures uh, with uh, fairly good intra and inter-observer variability, and even inter-study variability that ranges from about six to 10%, which again is higher variability than obviously the left ventricle um, because of the, of the complexities of the right ventricular structure. Um, and so where this is useful clinically, I think, is in patients where there's a question of RV dysfunction, in patients where you're concerned about RV cardiomyopathies, um, and also in patients with valvular heart disease where you want to uh, surely assess uh, RV remodeling, uh, MRI can be very useful. Now, a, a couple of things, you know, there are well-established normal reference values for the right ventricle using the methodology that I described. Um, and uh, two things that are important to keep in mind is that normal reference values for RV end diastolic volume are different between men and women, even after adjusting for BSA. So uh, in this uh, series right here, normal reference or upper limit of normal reference values for men for RV end diastolic volume index was as high as 106. Uh, but for women, uh, the upper limit was 92. So I think again, when you're looking at an RV and quantifying it and trying to determine is this RV enlarged or not, it's gonna be very important to uh, adjust it for BSA and also adjust it for, for patient sex. Um, in addition to that, uh, normal RV values uh, are different with aging as well. And so this is a, a series from the UK where they looked at a cohort of normal patients, normal volunteers I should say, uh, at different deciles of age anywhere from the 20s uh, all the way up to the 70s. And what you'll notice is the uh, upper limits of normal for young patients is quite a bit larger than the upper limits of normal for elderly patients. And so again, this is a common area where we encounter is uh, where it looks like the RV looks enlarged, even by volumes and numbers are, are enlarged, but you need to take into account what the patient's age is. And then obviously I think also take into account uh, other things that lead to uh, RV remodeling such as exercise as well. Um, so I think really when you're trying to do an assessment of the right ventricle, you really want to take into account both the patient's body surface area, the patient's sex, as well as the patient's age. Now, another question that oftentimes comes up is, um, you know, typically the way that we'll do our RV planimetry is by off of the short axis views, 
uh, is it better to do it off of axial views or long axis views where you have a series of long axis views? Um, and so there's actually a nice uh, publication almost 10 years ago uh, from a group at uh, University of Virginia where they looked at a series of patients and, and compared the uh, short axis planimetry versus a series of axial cine images that were obtained uh, and planimetry of, of the axial views. And, and, and these were uh, scenarios where there weren't any valve disease and they compared the stroke volume of the right ventricle to the phase contrast uh, flow coming out the pulmonary artery. Um, and, and really I think that the, the, the take home message here is that both the short axis method or the axial method uh, is acceptable. It gives you fairly good uh, uh, relationship uh, to uh, measure flow coming out the pulmonary artery, um, but it is important to keep in mind that, that most reference values that we have for RV size are based on short axis uh, planimetry, and as a result, most labs will use the short axis methodology for planimetry. The other thing I think also important to keep in mind, uh, and this is I think very important when, not just when you're doing the analysis of the images, but also uh, for the technologist when they're scanning the patient, um, is that although the, the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve uh, arises more apical than the mitral annular plane, the RV free wall, especially in the setting of uh, RV enlargement, uh, actually can enlarge and, and uh, go upward uh, towards the atrium. So as a result, if you have a basal slice that encompasses the mitral annulus, it may not encompass all of the right ventricle uh, in the setting of RV enlargement. And so as a result, we will routinely get one or two extra short axis slices up into the left atrium, uh, especially in cases where there's a question of RV enlargement to make sure that you're incorporating all of the RV volume in doing your RV volume assessment. Uh, so here's an example of a patient. Uh, you can see here, there's an enlarged uh, RV. Uh, with uh, significant RV dysfunction. In fact, we measured an RV EF of about 30% uh, with an RV end diastolic volume of almost 350 cc's. And, and this was a patient that presented with an acute uh, inferior wall myocardial infarction that underwent reperfusion. Um, but you can see that in addition to the hyper enhancement here in the inferior wall, you, you also notice an area of enhancement here within the uh, diaphragmatic uh, wall of the right ventricle. And this is a patient who has an associated RV infarction uh, as well. And if you look at the cine images, you'll notice there's a significant alteration in contractility in almost the bottom half of this right ventricle versus the anterior half of the right ventricle. So again, uh, very important, even if it's patients where you're uh, looking for post-MI salvage, post-MI LV ejection fraction, to take a close look at the right ventricle. Um, and these are just the clinical scenarios where an RV infarct uh, can be suspected. And then we know that clearly in patients who present with an inferior MI, the presence of associated RV infarction uh, is associated with a worse uh, prognosis. Um, so let, let's move on now to uh, the, uh, how we go through and assess the tricuspid and the pulmonic valves. So uh, a few things I think might be important to refresh your memory on, which is what is the normal anatomy of the tricuspid valve? So the tricuspid, as its name suggests, uh, has three leaflets. And so the nomenclature of these three leaflets are the septal leaflet, the inferior or posterior leaflet, and then the anterior leaflet. Um, and so when you're doing an assessment of the right ventricle, uh, it's important to uh, have an idea of which leaflet it is that you're assessing. Now typically uh, on an MRI four chamber view, uh, you're gonna definitely be uh, imaging the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve, but on that four chamber view, depending upon where it's drawn, you may either be imaging the posterior leaflet or the anterior leaflet. Generally speaking, we try to prescribe the leaflet to get to the posterior leaflet, um, but it's always important to cross-reference to verify that that is the case. And then on the RV three-chamber view that I showed you uh, that we typically will do as well, the RV inflow outflow view, um, you're typically going to be imaging the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve uh, as well as the inferior leaflet. But again, you have to be cautious because if the RV three-chamber view is, is angulated a little bit, you may in fact be picking up the septal leaflet. So um, always keep in mind that, that because there's three leaflets, you want to make sure, and, and any 2D imaging plane is generally going to show you two of those 
leaflets, you need to make sure you know which leaflet it is that you're imaging. Now, what are common causes of tricuspid regurgitation in clinical practice? And I think, you know, it's important to break it down into primary and secondary. So the primary causes of tricuspid regurgitation could be rheumatic heart disease, myxomatous uh, valve disease, Epstein's anomaly, uh, endocardial fibrosis, carcinoid, uh, trauma, and then also iatrogenic. So, uh, you know, whether that's pacemaker or ICD leads, or also in some of our transplant patients uh, who may be getting repeated RV biopsies, that there may be uh, a, a rupture or a tear of uh, some of the, the tricuspid subcortical apparatus. But keep in mind that the primary tricuspid leaflet abnormalities are much less common than secondary tricuspid regurgitation, which is what we see much more often. Um, and then I'll touch on this in a second here. But let me just show you some example scenarios of primary tricuspid leaflet abnormalities. So here's a patient with primary uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And you can see the, the um, uh, asterisk I have shows the location of the tricuspid coaptation zone. But you can see the signal void that we're seeing here for this TR jet is actually originating much more laterally than that uh, within this uh, uh, posterior leaflet. Um, and, and so this actually is a patient who's got a perforation uh, of the tricuspid leaflet. That's the culprit for their tricuspid regurgitation. Here's another example patient here where you can see the tricuspid leaflets are thickened, uh, shortened, and retracted. Um, and this is a patient who has uh, carcinoid heart disease. Uh, important to keep in mind that especially in the setting of a PFO, this could also then lead to left-sided uh, heart valve disease as well. Um, and here's another example, and I'm sure this will be touched on uh, later uh, in this conference series by Dr. Duarte when we talk about congenital heart uh, imaging. But here's a patient with Epstein's anomaly where you can see this uh, tricuspid leaflet uh, is very elongated and the coaptation point is, is much further along into the right ventricle itself. Uh, obviously, you know, just as, as one caveat, for assessment of the right ventricle for volumes and ejection fraction in a case like this, you really do need to have a series of a long axis or axial views because the short axis views may be very hard to identify what's uh, right ventricle versus what's uh, the area that's actually underneath uh, or the atrialized portion uh, of the ventricle. So um, now what about functional TR? So 90% of what we see in clinical practice is not going to be primary TR, but it's actually going to be functional tricuspid regurgitation. Um, and so what are the most common causes of that? So really probably by far the most common cause that we encounter in the United States here is going to be left-sided heart disease. And so that can be either due to LV dysfunction from LV cardiomyopathy, uh, increased uh, left-sided pressures due to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, uh, or left-sided valvular disease. Um, and again, the most common uh, left-sided valve disease that's going to lead to this is going to be mitral stenosis and mitral regurgitation. Um, in addition to that, you can have functional TR that's due to pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so this can be uh, you know, underlying uh, pulmonary, uh, intrinsic pulmonary uh, uh, capillary uh, or precapillary hypertension, uh, underlying lung disease, uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, uh, or uh, patients who have uh, uh, chronic uh, intracardiac shunts. Um, some other causes would be primary RV uh, cardiomyopathy, such as RV dysplasia, or uh, the example I showed you where there's an RV infarction. And then there's another category uh, that's called idiopathic or isolated tricuspid regurgitation, which is really thought to be due to atrial fibrillation uh, and basically chronic enlargement of the right atrium uh, and alteration in the tricuspid uh, uh, dynamics as a result of that. And so uh, this is a nice schematic showing uh, the mechanisms of functional tricuspid regurgitation. And you can see that there's uh, two kind of primary uh, uh, distinctions. One is a tricuspid annular dilatation. This is what you oftentimes see in the setting of right atrial dilatation, but also can sometimes be seen uh, with basal RV dilatation as well. Uh, and that's shown here. 
And then the other is when there's an RV geometry alteration that leads to uh, tricuspid leaflet tenting and papillary muscle displacement. And I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, if you look at the left-hand side image, uh, this is a patient with uh, tricuspid annular dilatation that's due to chronic atrial fibrillation and severe uh, biatrial enlargement. And you can see in this setting, the coaptation of the leaflets is much more flat. This, I think this cartoon schematic right here shows very nicely that as the annulus dilates, it leads to a reduction in the uh, overlap of the leaflets. And so there's almost a flat coaptation of the tricuspid leaflets. Uh, compare that to the patient on the right hand side, and this is what you most commonly will see uh, when it's uh, TR due to left sided heart disease, uh, is that it leads to an alteration in RV geometry and the papillary muscles of the right ventricle. And as a result, there is a, a tenting of the tricuspid leaflets, uh, as is shown nicely, I think, uh, in this example CMR image here, uh, or in this cartoon which depicts that process. So in addition to trying to identify the underlying mechanism of the abnormality, uh, another important thing is to try to actually determine what is the severity of your tricuspid regurgitation. And so uh, this is a, a publication from a, a couple years ago from our group where we looked at a series of over 500 patients uh, with uh, secondary tricuspid regurgitation and try to identify a quantitative threshold. Um, now the methodology that we use to determine the severity of tricuspid regurgitation here is actually similar to the method that's used for assessment of mitral regurgitation. And it's basically by comparing the right ventricular stroke volume to the forward flow coming out of the pulmonary artery. So this is using our standard planimetry of the RV to determine an RV stroke volume and then subtracting from that the forward flow coming across the pulmonary artery based on our phase contrast uh, methodology done at the pulmonary artery. And then that difference in the absence of an intracardiac shunt should be equivalent to your tricuspid regurgitation. So if we look at this example scenario here, this patient, when we went through and planimetered all of the end diastolic uh, slices, for this patient, we derived a RV end diastolic volume of 331 mLs. Uh, if we did the same thing in systole, we get an RV end diastolic, or end systolic volume of 161. That difference represents the stroke volume of the right ventricle, which, is, which in this case is about 170 mLs. Um, and then compare that to what the forward flow is coming out of the pulmonary artery from phase contrast methodology, uh, then that difference gives us the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, which in this case here looks like a significant volume of tricuspid regurg, about 61 mLs. Um, and again, you know, an important thing here that I you know, want to stress is when it comes to planimetry of the right ventricle, because again, you have to get an accurate assessment of RV stroke volume, um, it's important not only to identify the RV endocardial borders, make sure you have all slices, uh, short axis slices, but also recognize that there's a significant longitudinal component as I talked about in RV contractility. And so as a result, you may have anywhere from one or two or even three slices where there's RV volume in diastole, but during systole, that tricuspid annular plane has descended down. And so that same slice now, that same location during systole actually represents atrial volume and therefore should not be contoured. Okay, so um, in this uh, series, what we looked at was two things. We looked at two measures of tricuspid regurgitation severity. One is to tricuspid regurgitant volume, which is again derived by the method that I showed you here. And then the second is the tricuspid regurgitant fraction, which effectively takes into account what the overall flow state of this, uh, tri of this uh, uh, right ventricle is by, derive, by, or by dividing the tricuspid regurgitant volume by the uh, stroke volume of the right ventricle in the absence of pulmonic regurgitation. And as a result, there's uh, two things that we noted. One is that for tricuspid regurgitant volume, if we look at mortality, and this is again an adjusted hazard ratio uh, for all-cause mortality, is that tricuspid regurgitant volume gives you a nearly linear relationship. Increasing TR severity, secondary TR, uh, led to increasing all-cause mortality Whereas for tricuspid regurgitant volume, it was really uh, a flat curve early on. 
And then at about 30% regurgent fraction is when you see the inflection point uh, where the curve begins to go up. And then the group of patients with a tricuspid regurgent fraction more than 50% were the group that had really the highest uh, mortality and therefore then we came up with these kind of risk strata of a low risk strata of a tricuspid regurgent volume of less than 30 mLs or a fraction of less than 30 percent, a high risk strata where a tricuspid regurgent volume was more than 45 mLs or a tricuspid regurgent fraction was more than 50 percent, and then the intermediate risk strata was a regurgent fraction of 30 to 44 uh, I'm sorry, regurgent volume of 30 to 44 and a regurgent fraction of, of 30 to 50 percent, basically. Um, and then um, even after, you know, these relationships held true even after adjustment for uh, other clinical and imaging covariates, including RVEF, mitral regurg severity, as well as pulmonary artery pressure uh, measurements. And then these are just showing the Kaplan-Meier curves. And again, from the Kaplan-Meier curves, you can see that with tricuspid regurgent volume, with each strata of increased tricuspid regurgent volume, the, all the survival is reduced, but that regurgent fraction was really a better separator here. Uh, and, and those with a regurgent fraction of more than 50% uh, were the patient cohort that had the highest risk uh, with regard to all-cause mortality. Now, what about when you fix the tricuspid regurgitation? So what about after tricuspid regurg surgery? So this is some data uh, from a group out in the uh, Korea, in South Korea, where they looked at the impact of preoperative RV EF assessment by MRI on survival after tricuspid valve replacement. These were all patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. And I should say it should be either tricuspid replacement or repair. Um, and what they found was that a RVEF cutoff pre-op of 46% uh, did a pretty good job of stratifying those patients that had a pretty good outcome uh, versus those patients that had uh, increased risk of all-cause mortality or, or major cardiac events uh, after tricuspid valve surgery. So let's move now to the pulmonic valve um, and uh, briefly touch on how we assess pulmonic regurgitation uh, as well as some of the uh, abnormal or some of the morphology of the pulmonic valve that you may encounter. So here's an example of a patient that we can see here that if I just show you this RVOT view over here, you can see there's a signal void that we see in diastole uh, just underneath the pulmonic valve. This is your uh, pulmonic uh, regurgitant jet that we see here. We see that both in the RBOT view as well as we see that in this three-chamber RB view. And, uh, and associated with this is really a enlargement of the right ventricle and a flattening of the interventricular septum, uh, what we call a D-shaped septum. And you'll notice though that the flattening is primarily during, whoops, let me go back for a second. Let me see if I can pause this. Is primarily during uh, diastole, because you can see in systole the, the septum is flattened or is rounded, but then in systole, uh, in diastole, you can see the, the septum becomes flat. Uh, in systole, it takes on a little bit more of a rounded contour. And this is a septal pattern that you see uh, in the setting of RV volume overload, whereas in the setting of pressure overload, you'll see also systolic flattening as well. Now, so for this patient, um, there's an in-plane phase contrast that's done here just to visualize the jet. But for quantification of the severity, the goal is really to do a through-plane phase contrast above the pulmonic valves. And then you're measuring both the anterograde column of blood coming forward during systole as well as a retrograde column of blood uh, during diastole. And so in this patient, when we contour our phase contrast, we get a, a, a pulmonic regurgent volume of about 67 mLs. Um, and when you divide that by the forward flow, you get a regurgent fraction of about 50%, uh, consistent with this patient having uh, really severe uh, pulmonic regurgitation. Now, um, here's an example of uh, an interesting uh, pulmonic valve anatomy. You can see here what looks like a quadricuspid uh, pulmonic valve where you actually can see four leaflets to this patient's pulmonic valve. And then I'll show you another example case. And here's one where if you look at this image on the left-hand side, it looks like there's a bicuspid uh, pulmonic valve anatomy here, uh, as opposed to the normal trileaflet anatomy of the pulmonic valve. 
And associated with this is, in fact, uh, enlargement uh, of the pulmonary artery trunk as well. So really a bicuspid pulmonic valve with an aneurysmal pulmonary artery. So just like you can see on the left side, where you can see uh, abnormalities uh, of morphology of the valve, you can see the same thing on the right side as well. Um, here's an example of a patient with a repair tetralogy of Fallot. And, and again, the, the lecture on congenital heart imaging will go into this in much more detail. But many of these patients are left with residual pulmonic regurgitation. And the goal for imaging in these patients is to serial assess the severity of the regurgitation as well as the RB remodeling to identify a point at which uh, this pulmonic valve will need to be intervened upon. Um, and, and the threshold for this um, used to be about 160 milliliters per meter square for RV end diastolic volume. I think the more recent congenital literature suggests that probably at about 150 milliliters per meter square should be a trigger. And, and again, I think we'll touch on this much more. But again, this is a common indication where you'll get referrals to the CMR lab for assessment of the right heart. And you're really looking for not just severity of pulmonic regurg, but more importantly, the uh, extent of RV remodeling, both RV dilatation and also the development of RV dysfunction, which could all represent uh, triggers for uh, intervention for this pulmonic valve. Um, here's an example of a patient. You can see, if I show you the right-hand side image here, you can see that there is a, uh, a flow acceleration that we see in this uh, pulmonic valve during systole. This is a patient with uh, pulmonic stenosis. And our goals for pulmonic stenosis are similar to aortic stenosis. One is to try to do an anatomic valve area assessment, which in this case we measured out a pulmonic valve area of about 0.9 centimeters squared. Um, and also to do a velocity assessment, um, similar to the way that we would for the aortic valve. And in this case, we, we derived a uh, pulmonic uh, peak velocity of about 3.7 meters per second. Uh, also important to keep in mind that in addition to valvular abnormalities, uh, patients can also have a subvalvular component uh, or subvalvular abnormalities you can see here uh, where there's actually a uh, expanded RVOT muscle bundle uh, subpulmonic uh, hypertrophy leading to flow acceleration not so much at the valve level but really the acceleration starts at the subvalvular level here um, and again accurate imaging to try to identify and localize where the abnormality is is going to be key. So uh, let me wrap up here uh, and talk again about some of the advantages that we talked about CMR uh, when it comes to uh, the ability to visualize the entire right heart um, to, to uh, get RV volume as well as EF assessment. But also I think important to recognize a current limitation, which is the uh, challenge of assessing pulmonary artery pressures. Uh, of quantifying pulmonary artery pressures uh, non-invasively. Now, there are some MRI techniques that are underway. There's several publications in the literature looking at things like the uh, morphology of the right ventricle, looking at things like the flow pattern uh, using 4D flow CMR techniques of flow within the right ventricle or, and within the pulmonary artery to try to get some measures or estimates of pulmonary artery pressures. But again, I think this is an area where uh, continued work is required, uh, and this is an area where uh, MRI um, has current limitations, is the ability to directly quantify pulmonary artery pressures. So let me wrap up here and then I'll have time for a few questions if there's any from the audience. Um, you know, one I think is that CMR provides a, a optimal visualization of the right ventricle for assessment of RV size, uh, volumes, uh, and RV function. That it has fairly good reproducibility of measurements, so therefore it's an ideal test for serial uh, assessment of RV remodeling. Um, that it uniquely has the ability to identify RV fibrosis and RV infarction uh, using the delayed enhancement MRI technique. Um, and then, uh, as we talked about, most right-sided valve disease that we see, especially in adults, uh, tricuspid regurgitation that's secondary, is going to be due to left-sided heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, or atrial fibrillation. Um, that there's you know uh, outcomes-based uh, thresholds for CMR-derived tricuspid regurgitation severity, as I showed you. 
Um, and that one of the limitations, uh, or I would say an area that's still under investigation, is the ability to assess pulmonary artery pressures by cardiac MRI. So with that, I'm going to pause. Thank you all for your attention. And then uh, I'll open it up to any questions. So anybody tuning in uh, via the web, you can go to pollev.com, enter DeBakey, uh, or you can text your question by texting DeBakey uh, to 37607. And also, if we have anybody from within Houston Methodist on Zoom, uh, if, if there's any questions, uh, please um, uh, unmute yourself and uh, be glad to take any questions. Okay, I think uh, it looks like our- Dr. Shaw, uh, yeah. uh, George Waits here tuning in. Thank you very much for a great talk. and. Um, I, one of the things that you said uh, uh, triggered some interest for me regarding uh, sort of the interplay between atrial fibrillation and the generation of tricuspid regurgitation. And I, I'm just curious I, I, um, if, um, if we have any data available that points to, um, uh, well, it's often a chicken and the egg situation. And this is, it's the same with, with mitral regurgitation mm -hmm. too. But, um, you know, should fixing the MR precipitate a more likely chance of restoring normal rhythm, or would fixing the rhythm then help uh, pr uh, create a favorable remodeling in the atria um, to, to mitigate the regurgitant lesion? And so I, I don't know if, if there's data on, on, in this case, the tricuspid regurgitation that you mentioned. Of, um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, when are we too far gone with either one of those lesions? Um, and which should we fix first? That's probably not an easy answer. Yeah, no, I, I think, George, that's a, that's a great question that, that you're bringing up. And, and one of the things I would say is if you look through the literature, both for the mitral regurge and the tricuspid regurge literature, you'll see that this concept of atrial functional MR or atrial functional TR is one that's not been around for that long. And as a result, I think it's not really been well studied. There is some literature on the mitral regurgitation, on atrial functional mitral regurgitation, uh, where patients were imaged, uh, and again, this is mainly echo literature, uh, patients were imaged um, you know, before and then after uh, AFib ablation procedures uh, where they saw an improvement in the mitral regurgitation. I'm not aware of any uh, literature with regard to tricuspid, you know, atrial functional TR uh, to say, okay, is there an improvement in atrial functional TR after restoration of sinus rhythm? Um, but I think there is at least some for the mitral, but I think this is an area where really there's not that much that's, it's not really been well studied, and I think um, it's an area that, that requires much more investigation. I think an important thing, you know, if you talk to, uh, you know, the folks that are kind of designing structural heart therapies, I think an important thing, um, because these underlying mechanisms may lead to different ways that you approach it. Right. If you think about it, if you have a dilated annulus, then maybe annular reduction is more important than simply co-opting the leaflets together versus if you have more of a problem of the, the uh, you know, tethering of the leaflets, then maybe, uh, you know, the approach of uh, altering the leaflets may be more important. So I, I think, again, you know, this is an area where, you know, there's, a, there's an explosion of work that's being done, but I think these are all kind of things that are, you know, really only described in the last, you know, decade or two. Uh, and so I think there's lots of opportunities for more investigation and more work to be done. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, any, if there's no other questions, either from uh, external or from our audience here at Zoom, then I want to thank you all for your attention, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back again next week. <laughs>